is that you know trouble about this this domain the digital domain is that there's no follow-up you know you just have this thing and it, and it doesn't but actually there is a follow-up I, I meant to say there is a follow-up my group at uh, our group had established this this debate and i just hope that it goes on and we can sort of foster some kind of community where we can share ideas and publishes and publishing and things and and frankly many of you are students but you know I was in your situation at some time, and, and, and you know, uh, you too could become like Sanford and Marika or Antoine, or, or even better, I'm sure. So it's great to be able to kind of foster the next generation of, of young thinkers. So um, let's try and keep that platform alive. And if you get invited to this Discord thing, it's not, a, it's not spam, it's a serious invitation. And I'm not quite sure how, what the capacity of that platform is. Um, I know that WeChat has a, has a limit of 500, um, and there are a lot of people um, who are actually auditing this. Um, so let's just see, let's just see. Anyway, we're gonna to start today and uh, I'm really delighted to, that, that, we, that we have Sanford here. I've got to say, this is special for me as well. Um, and I think you should realize this is special. I was very careful to try to select the, the, what I thought the top people around um, and we have them here. And, and it's, a, it's a great honor to, to, to be in a team with Sanford. Um, so Sanford, are you, are you ready to, to kick off? <clears throat> No. <laughs> yeah. Hello, guys. You hear me? Mm. You do. Yep. I'm having my coffee. <laughs> I am juiced. I am juiced. You know, uh, how do you do this, man? How do you do this? Um, I wrote to you guys, that's to say the panelists, yesterday, um, as I realized uh, I could barely walk after what turned out to be a four-hour um, PhD defense. Um, I've never seen anything like that before in my life, and um, the preparation for it was a bit frantic as well, as you can imagine. Um, who reads a PhD dissertation who doesn't absolutely have to, and who reads it in advance? So anyway, though, obviously there was a marathon of, uh, of, uh, of reading and immersion, and it was not light, uh, and so on and so forth. I also have to find a notary and a whole variety of, uh, of, of, of those types of people who are not working and haven't worked in four months. I have to find all of those people today. And I have another question because I've not, the communications seem to be breaking down. Uh, do you know offhand, Neil, have I missed the neuroscience uh, uh, podcast thing I'm supposed to do, or is that this afternoon? Um, you've you've missed it. I, I was I was Sanford on that thing yesterday. Um, and is uh, anything that uh, anything that maybe that that uh, it trumps for? I hate to use that word. That uh, that trumps for four hours of, of a PhD examination. I had eight hours on different things yesterday. Um, uh, uh, I was co-opted onto two of them at the last minute and. Uh, which was fantastic, I've got to say fantastic, um, but it's, it's exhausting. And uh, like you, I'm, I'm, exist I'm surviving, and maybe like many of, this, many of the people listening, uh, surviving on a cocktail of, of, of uh, uh, espresso and, and uh, coffees and so on. Um, but it's, well, it's uh, go. You're a talker, you know, you're a talker. You've got, <laughs> you've got the connections between the brain and the, uh, and the eyes and the, uh, and the social world. I know everybody thinks I'm a talker, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm a guy who just wishes everybody would fucking shut up <laughs> and leave me alone. And it's true. I'm happy what I'm thinking. I'm an inward person. I'm not an outward person, regardless of what everybody seems to think. So, uh, you know, there we are. I would also say that, you know, some of these sessions, from what I can tell, because I go, some of them are extraordinary and some of them are just more crap. You know, just people talking, shooting from the hip, nothing prepared, uh, coming to the table with absolutely no real reason, to, no real claim on other people's attention, and so on and so forth. At other times, there are spontaneous emergences uh, that are happening, and there's sometimes a level of conversation which, frankly, um, isn't happening anymore, in my opinion, in real rooms. Um, on the other hand, I have a distant memory of all that now. I can barely really believe that we used to fly to places uh, and meet and have meals together and, you know, get together in rooms and hug each other. It's pretty amazing to imagine that once happened. Um, 
So look, I didn't, I missed yesterday. Uh, I gave you guys, I'm telling this to everyone, I, the option of having a looser conversation. I tell you, I had no time to prepare what I had hoped to prepare. I mean, I started preparing the thing on hallucinations days and days ago because I was so appalled at the misuse of that term and the banalization of uh, a lot of uh, science, which I feel uh, that Neil Seth's uh, interest in being a TED star has, um, has, uh, has actually created. I think there's not a lot of good that can come from uh, that kind of thing, even though I do believe that neuroscientists uh, do merit um, today, today, they do merit um, a claim on our attention uh, on the order of, uh, you know, rock stars. I do. I do in a way, though uh, a lot of this stuff goes uh, badly south. Uh, now, I'm, I am sad to have missed that event. I guess I was so overwhelmed. I agreed to do, I agreed to the, uh, I agreed to the date right smack in the middle of my uh, that PhD defense, which I known about uh, for several weeks. So that's just an email problem, an email problem of uh, properly assigning attention in such an unnatural way uh, inside of this uh, multi-attentional uh, screen universe. I don't think this is gonna work, everybody. I don't think it's gonna work. There are virtues and there are vices and it isn't gonna work. Uh, the human attentional apparatus, the human sensorium is so important, so delicate, so particular, and actually so diverse and varied, but it isn't, it isn't like the ones we are building in uh, you know, engineering labs and studios and factories, and it's not exactly like the ones we are conceiving of. So, you know, what can I say to you guys? So I wanted to ask, because like I said, I, I proposed, and I don't even know where it is right now. I got so many bloody manuscripts on my desk, but it's here somewhere. I proposed that we do either two things. I mean, there are a lot of people who wrote, I could see in the, who wrote, to me and also on the chats who seemed to feel that it was they really wanted to hear about the boundaries what i did notice is that nobody understood even the reference to the boundary so in fact everybody's idea of what the boundary was all about is completely different from what it was that i had wished to present what i'd wish to present is going to only disappoint you um it's uh it's technical it's scientific and it is boring at this point i mean i can't believe we're in day five of this extended and very rich uh, conversation and that anybody could possibly be interested in resisting if you like the spontaneous uh flow of whatever it is that's emerging now i don't know exactly what's emerging i wasn't here yesterday but i would i gave two options one is, is i could completely shut down the momentum and go back to the notes that I had made and present this thing on whatever it was, it was on boundaries, but it was also on enjoyment as, um, as a, the expansion, shall we say, of enjoyment, which is uh, uh, not just a play. It's not about pleasure, really. It's about expanding our access, if you like, to, uh, uh, to the world. Um, as a fundamental, uh, shall we say, direction, or we could even say gradient uh, in the universe, one which we near, really need to, uh, we really need to reconnect to, because that is not where the great initiatives currently, uh, shall we say, are going, or are, are, are they're not, it is, it is not one of the areas uh, of priority that we've managed to define for ourselves uh, uh, as we create this new handshake between the technical, if I may use this term, uh, the technosphere, which really refers to every component of our cosmic, shall we say, ecology that has to do with um, engineered things, shall we say, um, 
the application of rational principles, even mathematics, if you like, to our world. Um, but the technosphere, as we all know, is also a, it's many more, it's many things beyond that also, of course. It's a, it's a, um, you know, it has to do with everything from the senses to consciousness um, and possibly also spirit and destiny. Very weird terms, I know, for uh, for many, though, you know, I guess it's worth, I say it, it has to be worthwhile that back in the 1990s, architecture permitted um, people trained in, um, in uh, yeah, there were there were a number of people who were, shall we say, admitted to the architecture sphere, admitted to become um, part of the discourse in architecture, which I think was, you know, I loved it because I was one of the beneficiaries of it in the sense that, uh, but what I'd like to say is people who are not, who are trained in other areas and the fact that they persist, even though they're often these days dismissed as mere boomers, um, I would like to say that uh, it's, uh, it's important at every stage, especially in a, in a, in a, in a, in a discipline as, as, as dynamic in a way as open and frankly as hungry in good and bad ways, as hungry as architecture to constantly reassess um, some of the um, Oh, I don't know what to say. Some of the ethical, uh, some of the underlying um, uh, idea, some of the underlying developments that take place, and reassess the connections, if you like, to um, um, I don't know what to say to traditional, uh, to, to traditional concepts, traditional ideas, to traditional values, et cetera, et cetera. When I mean by that traditional values, I'm not talking about family, although family is a very interesting idea. Um, especially in its current uh, mutations. But, you know, you could call that community, but, and so on and so forth. I'm rambling because that's what happens when I have a black screen in front of me. But um, what I wanted to ask again is to get back to the situation which is at hand, which is that when all of us, <clears throat> 60, 70 people get together, <clears throat> I notice faces. I went through the thing again. I noticed faces that have been here since the first day. And, you know, I'm thinking, what the fuck brings you guys back? Um, and I know it's lively and I know it's interesting, but who stays interested in a topic like this for that long? Wow. I'm impressed. And I have to say, it's the reason I'm here is because you're here. I want it out so badly today, you guys. I want it out so badly I could taste it. And here I am. Um... Whatever happened yesterday, and whatever do those who are still feeling, uh, let's say, invited or at least uh, present to speak, what happened yesterday, and where do you intuit the um, directions of curiosity and interest, and how can we integrate the concerns of the, um, the 60 or 70 people who are here? Um, I know that a huge percentage of what ideas are intended by the presenters get massively deformed by the time they reach you and by the time you metabolize them and send them back to us. But without the, and, and, and often that's depressing, frankly. It's depressing. Why? Because you, one thinks to oneself, well, there really is no... Conversation is not a solution. It's not a solution. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. It is very valuable, but it's not the solution to intellectual work. I want to say that right off the bat. It is all but useless. It is a fake, it is like fake news. Uh, conversation is not where those kinds of things happen. That's to say where the real development of ideas, the real grasping uh, of a certain, shall we say, depth. It is not where immersion actually takes place. But conversation is extremely important. 
as a form of accelerator, shall we say, distribution. And it produces, I know this will probably please uh, Marika, it produces a great deal of, of, shall we say, productive accidents. The misunderstandings in conversation are where the productivity very often arises, which isn't to say that misunderstandings are a priori interesting, because they aren't. And I know that there were periods in my field, which was a, back in the 19 whatever, 80s, 70s, was, uh, you know, there was a fetishization of misreading. Um, this was part of what I consider one of the great bogus sort of uh, 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 ideas in the humanities uh, of a kind of a performative uh, component, uh, especially in the study of, uh, of literature and, um, uh, and well, even theory, etc. cetera. Uh, all of these things maintained their continuity even if they went underground for a while and rose up again in the great, shall we say, in the great heterogeneous uh, party uh, that emerged after the demise of the, shall we say, the canonical thinkers. Uh, everybody is, uh, you know, it was certainly abetted by social media and by the ability for attention never to have to go backwards, but only to, uh, shall we say, check in with existing uh, feeds uh, in the world and in the environment. These are ecological, we could say these are ecological changes which are constitutive of who we are today, but do not for sure always serve us well. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it's such a rich environment because, uh, well, on one hand, anything goes, which is a, a good and a bad thing. Um, we need to figure out what the new forms of, um, well, the new forms of discipline and rigor need to be in order to be able to combine these two terms, if you like, the spontaneity and the miscellaneity of what um, is available to us. Uh, just the way in AI, for example, there's, you know, there's the system that generates possibilities and then there's the, I don't remember what they call it. There's always, uh, there's always different needs at the one that, uh, you know, there's the pruner and there's the proliferator. There is the judge, there is whatever it is that, uh, that decides which outcomes are selected because they are more likely to be useful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, we need a new kind of cultural, attentional, and intellectual hygiene, which doesn't simply create, which doesn't simply call for a return to the, the, the riches of the old modalities. That's to say, when I make these plea, you know, I make these comments, they're meant to be ironic, and I know Neil sees it that way, but it's not sure you out there in your 30s and or late 20s see it that way when I make when I call him the you know a man of the book etc uh, there is it's important simply to understand that access to what we call the environment let's say to the information in our environment as if we were as you know a machine uh, constantly trying to refine its capacities to respond to the environment in real time. And I will say this, that real time is a huge blunder. It's a huge blunder to give it greater importance uh, as, a, um, as a philosophical commitment, if you like, to the other forms of time. By the way, I know I'm rambling, so don't worry about it. But I do want to get back to the question here. I, I, I do feel like I, you know, somebody said, "Look, Quinter, if you're going to turn this over to the, to the, uh, to the whole, to this, you know, to everyone, uh, to complicate, you should do something that provokes." So I guess this is what it, it, what it's going to be. We need to incorporate. We need to incorporate in a very deliberate way. We need to incorporate uh, uh, the performance of our attentiveness to other forms of time 
in uh, in uh, in the way we bring ourselves to the present in a community. That's uh, what I would like to say, in which I suppose, in my own clumsy way, unprepared, I want to say, <laughs> in this case, uh, I, I would like to see what I'm doing right now. But um, to get back to my ultimate question here, and that is this: What happened yesterday? Um, how did what happened yesterday? begin to express an emergent and spontaneous movement in whatever happens when you bring people together in this kind of way and you stay with it. Staying with it, I have to say, I'll, if I can say, is a new kind of, no, no, it's not a new kind of time. It's a deliberate form of discipline. Um, you know, it's one, you know, I can say I personally practice anyone who does yoga, anyone who meditates, anyone who, for example, experiments with, uh, shall we say, um, substances that alter uh, their relationship, if you like, to their uh, internal life. Um, anybody who practices forms of attention, uh, which are in, intended, if you like, to provide access <clears throat> to experiencing, uh, shall we say, um, aspects of their world, uh, which are not available to only short-term attention. Uh, know what I'm talking about here, but in this case, I'd like to know. Like to know. Like to know. Oh, I'm getting some, I'm getting some, um, oh, maybe it's gone now, I was getting an echo. I'd like to know what happened yesterday, and I'd like to know whether or not we can transform this into a framework to have a spontaneous discussion, because my only other option actually is to go back to that paper I, I, had, pre I had prepared previously, uh, which I don't think is a good idea. It ignores, if you like, it ignores what's happening. So is anything happening? So Sanford, let me let me just say, I, I mean, actually, it's a treat just to have you kind of thinking on the spot, because I, in some ways, I think this is the real potential of the kind of dialogue that one can get, even though it is a kind of disembodied dialogue, it's nonetheless a dialogue, you know, and when the reason why we didn't want to have uh, people giving lectures, only that we were more interested in the kind of these panel discussion situations is because if you give a, a, a pre-prepared lecture, it's already there and it's just delivered without any feedback, you know? And I think that is one of the kind of crucial things that happens, you know, that the, the possibility that there could be a dynamic uh, interaction and, a, and an emergent phenomenon, something could come out of it that it hadn't been prepared. And I think that's when, that's when some of these discussions have been successful. I, you know, I, I agree that on the whole, some of them have been a little bit um, uh, less prepared than others. But some have really taken off and gone in a new direction. I had not imagined. I had not imagined that. Um, and there have been a number of these. I would say, for example, that yesterday I was pre-recording. It's a kind of interesting question. If you're pre-recording, what do you get live? What's the difference? It's kind of interesting in its own way. But I, I was involved in a discussion with Nadia Tarani, uh, Hashem Sakis, um, Ila Bauman, and Eva Franch. Uh, and you know two of those characters um, from your time in Cambridge. And I must say that was a really an interesting discussion. It was about the future of the university and a very productive in a way something came out that was that was not there before. On occasion, it could be unproductive. I'm not quite sure how productive yesterday's discussion was in the sense that uh, it seemed that um, uh, Antoine was uh, didn't we, we couldn't agree on this question. We were talking. I was claiming, um, you know, my view on this, that there's no such thing as a digital building and the buildings I've got that essay right beside me here, believe it or not. I yeah, yes, okay. So, and, and I was, and, and Antoine didn't think that at all, but I, I just think, you know, the reason why I thought it was kind of potentially useful, just going back to your analogy of a GAN, you know, I think the generator, the one who's kind of like churning out stuff, you know, and then there's the critic or the discriminator. And one way of, of looking at that is to say, well, there's a lot of stuff being generated, right? And not all of it's good, but that's the role of the critic. And this is where I think you're so useful, Sanford, is that you can come in and, and call BS and all that stuff, you know? And, and that's certainly when I sum up that, the, the, the book, the AAD, AAD on the discrete, I, I really felt that. I thought, this is, this is just nonsense. You know, someone's got to say something about it. Um, so I think it's important to see that. And I think that there can be, it can be, uh, that's how you maintain standards by this critical, discourse and I think see that's what that's really what your role is because you know I think 
I, I, I don't want to disparage architects because I think they are have very creative people, but I think the whole question about misunderstanding is, is kind of the creative misunderstanding and who forget who was that said that, but you know, that's what architects do. And we really need this kind of the, the, the people like yourself. Actually, I also, I could like to compare you to, to Mark Cousins because he in a way um, also extemporizes. I mean, he performs um, and uh, that's really what we need to kind of keep this, this discourse alive and to keep it, to keep it going. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I very much appreciate this. And I think, frankly, the, the debate is better than just the pre-prepared monologue um, from that point of view. Well, then you kind of just assented to us opening up today. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just to say, Sanford, that, that um, we have several platforms operating now. We had the Zoom platform. One of the strange things was, was more people, way more people signed up to, uh, to, to audit these, these, these uh, workshops than actually to be uh, what we call active users. And uh, several hundred- How do you exactly. invite them? Can you invite, I mean, are you able to do that, to invite uh, them to- We, we, were, t we were told that we, we, there was a limit to what we could oh, have on Zoom because you get Zoom bombing. And um, uh, anyway, it, 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 it there are a lot out there and I'd love to hear their voices. And I don't know how we can manage to do that, whether they can... Um... Why don't you give me your cell phone number? Uh, well, <laughs> sorry, sorry, man. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no. But I, think, I think that there is, it's on, for example, it's on Billy Billy. There's some people in China watching on Billy Billy. I know there's some very smart individuals I know who, who are listening to that. And it's also on YouTube. And I guess there are feeds in both of those where they could be there could be sort of a, a feedback and things. I just wanted to go and just, but, but before we go further, I wanted to go and pick you up on something though, Sanford, in the sense that, um, uh, I mean, what I see in, in with the world of neuroscience is um, the possibility of a kind of a new, a fresh set of ideas um, that, that runs between two kind of polar conditions. One, it's, it's kind of, in a way, um, I've got to be careful of my use of my terms. It's not proven, but it, it, it does rely on a certain scientific rigor, shall we say, with all the limitations that science got. You know, it, it's, it has that. At the same time, it can be <clears throat> impossibly scientific and, and inaccessible in some ways. In a way, you know, I, for all the problems, I really appreciate um, someone like Slavoj Žižek. Now, Slavoj, I met him first in 1994. I invited him to a conference in Romania. And he accepted, but didn't turn up because he double booked. But anyway, he's someone I've had my eye on. I think he's a fabulous thinker. But the criticism that he gets from within the philosophy community, <clears throat> he's, he's looking for a, um, uh, a kind of a laugh a minute. A laugh. Every, every sentence has to have a, a, a kind of a, <clears throat> something entertaining about it, which is kind of a little bit like the, the, the TED Talk mentality to some extent. At the same time, <clears throat> I think really in the States in particular, um, what we really need are these public intellectual figures who can... Um, kind of draw upon uh, some astonishing body of knowledge at the same time, open it up in a very pu public way uh, and make it accessible. Um, so I don't have that problem. And if you look back on time, I think the way that say Roland Barthes was able to, you know, write for, uh, I don't know what it's writing for, but or Figaro or something, or looking back to the thirties in Germany, people like uh, Krakauer and Benjamin writing in the Feuilleton or the, or the Frankfurter Zeitung, you know, this is what was actually, I think that's important. And, and, um, in the States, I don't see that at all. You know, I mean, there are people like Noam Chomsky who could really be active, but somehow it's a very kind of European thing to have these public intellectuals. But I think they're important for all the, the problems about it. I think that it's important. I think Slavoj Žižek is really a, a wonderful provocateur and, and, and other people like Judith Butler to some extent do it, but not as much as Slavoj. Now, what I'm looking for in some ways is a figure who might, and I guess it's impossible to replicate Slavoj. I mean, he's a, he's a one-off in many ways. Um, but somebody who might be able to um, uh, elevate the discourse or take the discourse of neuroscience and while not losing the rigor, at the same time, make it accessible in, in some way. Because I think that's, if we had that, that would be a new injection of something else that really would take us, would take us further forward. And I, and I just think that the idea of kind of engaging the public in a way and finding this, this medium between the, the, the popular and the kind of, the, the, the kind of deep kind of research internal research-based work. I, I think that's really what we need. And I, I just, I, I really applaud that. I, I really like the idea of, 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 let's say intellectuals not being kind of remote in their kind of academic kind of wherever, um, but actually engaging. Um, and without that, we find ourselves in a very banal society. So, so I, you know, I, just want, I want to say that I've, I'm enjoying everything you say. And I think that's, 
out of that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be pre-prepared. It's the interaction, the emergent interaction um, that makes it interesting. I don't know whether Marika wants to sort of add anything to that. Yeah, you know, before Marika speaks, I want to ask her if she would mind, and you can say no, Marika, uh, just so we can all orient ourselves, would you mind just telling us in the most discreet way as you wish, what you were intending to talk about tomorrow, just so we can put it into our, uh, onto the table as we discuss today. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, the only reason, I mean, I, the only reason I can't talk about it today is because I, I am not done with my slideshow. I need to sit there and like put a bunch more slides in this thing. Um, just, and, and, um, not what even like print slides, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> just like necessary <laughs> slides. Um, What's the topic? Uh, well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go see model. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but I but I I kind of I kind of start Simon Don and take the parts of Simon Don that make sense to me and that I think are fresh and interesting, um, and then go and then go into liveliness. Okay. Okay. Now, I, I, may I, I say I, something I, else? Oh, I know no. that. Oh, I was just gonna say because I can't. Like I don't have you guys. You guys both have this uh, this capacity, and it's it's one that I admire, but cannot duplicate. To to at maybe as Sanford was saying, to stay with it. So you're you're comfortable talking about um, uh, uh, think, uh, entire philosophical movements that I think l- largely the the architectural uh, uh, field has kind of chewed through. Um, badly (laughs) regurgitated parts of, misunderstood other parts of, and then like burped out little bits of. (laughs) And (laughs) I, I, uh, I, I'm not, I, like, I actually get like a kind of sick feeling in my stomach when, when I, when I, you know, like, for instance, there are parts of Deleuze that that I think are just, just so ripe for reincorporation in the discourse today. Um, But it's very, I'm constantly, I'm only able to take bits of it. I can't do the stuff that's been ruined by other people in the way that, that you guys both seem to be able to do. So I, what I was well, just well, gonna we're say- we're older than you. First of all, we're way older than you. And number one, let me just say this, the swimming pool wasn't peed in when we first dove in. Uh, well, I know. <laughs> I know, but you then you then were there at the party when everybody peed Yeah, in. but we, we left that pool, I believe. We left the pool. <laughs> so um, I also am maybe less committed to um, the kind of the base superstructure thing um, where, uh, you know, I, I think I'm c- quite comfortable um, f- finding uh, Finding opportunities in the shallows of, of what architects are actually doing in the in the world today, um, uh, rather than feeling like I have to distance myself myself in the depths. Um, so maybe that'll come through a little bit tomorrow. Um, and I also I have to say I think I am less committed. Definitely, maybe not compared to Neil. Your position is less clear to me, Neil. But um, but certainly than Sanford, I'm less committed to um, uh, the kind of the essential truth of science. Um, and I'm and I'm quite okay with certain um, fictions, um, fictions that I, I must say, I think in a circuitous way come from my association with Stanford, <laughs> and come from maybe even his his literary theory background. Um, the kind of necessary truth that only exists in fictions is something that I'm I'm okay with. Um, so that'll probably come out tomorrow, but that should give you plenty of things to to attack on all kinds of levels, Stanford. but not if you're muted. Apologies, you're right. Uh, I'd let, may, no, I'm not here to attack anything. I'd like to now let Neil orchestrate the uh, opening up, I'm hoping it'll work, the opening up of, uh, of whatever has been stored out there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the observers. Yeah, well, I think uh, can I just can I just m- make a plea though that you do? I don't care if you think it's boring or not. I don't necessarily think you're the best judge of whether you're being boring or not. Is my in my experience, I think maybe you should talk about the boundary because I'm quite curious about that. Well, I mean, I'll write an email. I'll write an email. <laughs> it's uh, it's just a it's it's a it's a it's what they would say now would be tone deaf 
because it's, you know, it's a, it would just step outside, I suppose, of what I imagined was the, um, was the flow, if there was a flow that was emerging. But I also know there's a, there's a damming up of, uh, of, of content, shall we say, in our 60 odd um, uh, participants. Um, no, I will say, I know that there is, that is the case. I see interesting intimations of, of uh, universes out there in the, in the little chats. On the other hand, you often when people make inquiries, they're completely, you know, they're, they're not at all uh, related to the intention of what the, of what the speaker uh, uh, had, had, you know, had intended and the introdu uh, introduced. So, I mean, we're taking a risk, as you do whenever, especially in New York City, when you open a lecture up to the audience, there's usually a schizo sitting somewhere in the fucking room who's going to just start, who's going to stand up and just, you know, completely take the whole, derail the entire uh, event. But um, I think that uh, I'm going to let Neil consider how we do that. Uh, whatever we do now, what do we do for the next, uh, you know, 70 yeah, minutes? Actually, I, I find this very productive in itself, but just, I mean, just one other, this is not the way you attend boundaries, boundaries at all, but um, I just want to look back at this moment that almost 20 years ago now, maybe it's over 20 years ago, 23 years ago now, um, when I, I put together a book, I know that Marika's read it, uh, Rethinking Architecture, and the, the way it was actually, it's a bit like a gan again in some ways, because I, what was, the, it was, I, when I, in the introduction, I, I spoke about boundaries in some senses um and uh the number well, in a in a very straightforward way very straightforward the boundaries of the discipline and you know in a way to my mind the the, the real problem of architecture was that it was completely within its own boundary it was having a discussion with itself and and failed to open up to anything beyond that you know it's so I, the way i had to describe it was a this kind of self legitimizing discourse if anyone came in from outside you know, Prince Charles or something, they would just say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But actually what really kind of, I think the way that architecture moves forward is by often by engaging with, with something outside and, and, and kind of a, a interaction with some of those ideas. And certainly when I was, last night we had a discussion with Peter Eisman and um, he was very negative at my supervisor, Joseph Rickford, with whom I, I worked on the Alberti. But actually what Joseph did, he started bringing in Levi Strauss and, and Freud and so on into a discourse about urbanism. Now, for all its conservatism, the idea of a town really was quite a kind of groundbreaking, you know, uh, uh, project in the sense that it, it kind of opened up some new ways of thinking about urbanism by incorporating these new tools. Maybe that's the wrong word to use, but to kind of unpick and challenge the way that we we're thinking. So in a way, that was the premise behind Rethinking Architecture. And there are a number of very direct interfaces where, you know, for example, Adorno takes on Luce and uh, gives him a hard time. And, and Frederick Jameson takes on Kenneth Frampton and gives him a hard time. But I guess the point about it um, was, and also I think uh, Bernard uh, Derrida in certain ways as well, um, the point about it is when you get this critique from the outside, the point about it, it's not a negative thing. We need that critique. You know, you might, you might find your arguments demolished, um, but that's when you're aware of the, 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 the fragility in the argument itself and it allows you to kind of really to, to go back to the argument and try and you know, make it more convincing. So I think that in itself is such an important thing. And, uh, there is a risk, of course, that, that and maybe this is what Marika was referring to, that, that actually that the opposite happens. <clears throat> that in other words, that um, instead of using those voices as a kind of critical commentary to kind of keep architecture like a GAN, make it more kind of critical, but then, that you, you simply appropriate, uh, and this was the final, sent, the final paragraph in anesthetics that came out two years after that, you, you appropriate um, the world of philosophy like a fashion accessory. Um, and at the time, you know, you, there'd be the reviews at the AA where there were these projects and there would be quotes from Derrida and Deleuze that would just kind of come in to justify the argument, which seemed to me entirely superficial, very postmodern in some sort of ways. And, and this is my deep worry, actually, the kind of the superficiality of that particular culture. You brought in this content to try and give it certain depth. And that remains my suspicion with projects like Triple O, to some extent, it remains my suspicion about some of the ideas in the Bartlett right now, um, there's a kind of veneer of, of a kind of intellectual something where you posit something and it doesn't, doesn't really have that criticality. It's a kind of manifesto in some ways without that. So to my mind, the, the, and, and maybe I'm guilty of that as well, sure. Um, so my mind, you know, the possibility of, of not 
delivering a manifesto, but having a more critical discourse that keeps architecture alive. And that's why I'm thinking, I'm wondering what, what Marika's going to be saying tomorrow about, about vitality and those kind of questions. That's really what we need right now. And I think this is the role of this particular um, forum in some ways. You know, when I, whenever I've, I used to go to, to Mark Cousins' lectures when I was in London. I was teaching, of course, you know, uh, but on a Friday evening, he would come out and um, I'm enormously urbane. I mean, I really appreciate Mark. I mean, I disagree with him on many things. And I think he's kind of stuck in a world of Kant and, and Freud, maybe. But nonetheless, there was this kind of forum, you know, and it kind of reminded me in some senses of the way that people talk about what it was like in ancient Greece, where the, the, the agora became a kind of debate. And the other thing I think I thought interesting about you and Mark is in the sense of that the tradition, again, I don't know much about it, except I've, I've heard about it, this kind of peripatetic intellectual that's kind of deterritorialized, but literally not de just deterritorialized in kind of going around and having, you know, debates in, in different cities, but deterritorialized in terms of thought. You know, and I think that's really what, what you're offering is a kind of like a more dynamic potential that we desperately need in architecture. And, and it needs to be there the whole time. Um, and the real problem, I think, is, is, is that maybe that message has been lost. Uh, uh, the, the, whatever the, the, the debates were in Rethinking Architecture, it's, it's somehow it's been forgotten about now. I think we need to do this. This is why you're so important to have right now continually not giving us instructions. Not, I mean, we don't need instructions. In fact, that's the worst thing. But to kind of be a foil, to be a gan, as it were, to be telling us this is bullshit or something. Uh, and that's... That's how we keep going, keep up improving. So I didn't, I, I, this is even in itself, I find a kind of educational exercise, at least I do personally. How about you, Marika? Yeah, that's kind. Uh, uh, what are we going to, how can we proceed? Look, first of all, I would like to say- uh, wait, I wanna, wait, I wanna wait. note, I wanna note two, two comments so there, so there are no, no three comments in the, in the chat that we might wanna to respond to. Um, one is another person asking about boundaries. Another another person is asking about hallucinations, and then two people have brought up brought up Dreyfus. Dreyfus. So just, uh, yeah. Can I just add something there, just to hallucinations? Thing. I mean, I, I, I actually, I don't know if you you heard the Anil Seth. I've got a lot of respect for Anil Seth. He's he's a really a, a very sharp individual, and I think the idea of somehow science being kind of, uh, this is Marika's kind of comment, science being kind of too almost positivistic of things. Actually, what he's saying precisely is using science to say, we don't know, it's kind of, our perception of the world is a kind of a, a pre, is a, is, 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 is a, a kind of, um, we're guessing what's out there. It's, there's nothing at all about it. He's actually highlighting the fact that it's a kind of, <laughs> well, I wouldn't say fantasy, but it's kind of, it's somehow mediated through the imagination in some senses, but anyway, I'll stop there. Sorry, Sanford. Well, I, I just first like to say one thing. Uh, every generation will assemble its own bugaboos. Uh, I use that word bugaboo. I know not everybody here is uh, has that has English as their first language and is unlikely to know exactly what that word means, but you can look it up. Uh, I chose bugaboo over straw man. Um, because it's not a straw man. It's a, just a bugaboo. It's a, it's a, it's a character uh, that needs to be actively uh, dismantled, performatively dismantled, in order to orient their own attention and, and their discourse. Now, in terms of how a certain generation uh, uses that term science, I'm not going to intervene in it. I can only say the term science means absolutely nothing to me. Uh, when I use it, I'm usually referring to a body of knowledge, but also an attitude. And my attitude, really, a better term would simply be um, real, what is real. And um, um, in that sense, I do invoke the debates that are happening a little bit in the penumbra, a little bit in the shadows, all around uh, the architecture these days, and that is to say the realism, idealism sort of uh, uh, debates. Um, all I really do believe is that you can't really make shit up um, without knowing the proper place of invention, if you like, in relation to um, claims, if you like, on which the inventions, uh, uh, you know, what, what, you, what you present them uh, depending on, that's to say, 
there is, you know, it's either true or it isn't. You know, when you get so-called theorists like Timothy Morton, uh, whose interest and curiosity about nature is almost nil and therefore permits himself to say whatever the hell he likes uh, about anything and create a kind of a veil, an atmospheric sort of uh, sensibility that people might find amusing, but who are abs who are given and uh, who are who are who are who are given no uh, no direction and no path, if you like, to 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 understanding. Um, I find it uh, I find it absolutely depressing. But it's also true that the body of knowledge, you know, to shoot from the hip, uh, the way architecture was able to do for so long. Um, and by the way, any architecture that doesn't have a guiding principle, that doesn't even have a tacit philosophy behind it, is, is not an architecture that, that merits any interest whatsoever. I was fascinated, if, I don't, if you don't, guys don't mind this little bit of a thing, I was fascinated by, by this guy, John Bolton. I don't know how many of our non-Americans are following our garbage political culture right now, but John Bolton is one of the great assholes, but not even close to the asshole that runs our country. He recently, everybody might know that he wrote this book, et cetera, that he was, you know, this bizarrely hawkish um, guy who, you know, who, 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 who aided the, uh, the Trump administration when the Trump administration needed this uh, type of, uh, of, of uh, justification for some of the moves they were making. But now that he is in the crosshairs of everybody, Republicans and Democrats alike, with the publication of his book, which is a kind of a tell-all about the horrors of what happens in the White House, how decisions are made, et cetera, et cetera. He made a comment that I found absolutely unbelievable, fantastic, incredible. I mean, it's true that he's a far more intelligent uh, and disciplined character than, almost, than most of the others in the White House, but he said the problem with this fucking president is he doesn't have a philosophy. And if you don't have a philosophy, you cannot actually govern. So I would say to go back to that, that is something that is required. I know that Marika would agree with it, but uh, it has to be steeped in actuality, in actual things. Um, that's to say we are all aware of a anti-science bias that emerged with the generation who were unable to find a voice who came out of the schools of the 1990s, particularly the American schools, but then in very soon after uh, the European schools uh, in the early 21st century. Um, and if I may just say this, I know it's fucking, I, you know, I say this again and again in my introductory classes, uh, because the key to understanding where we are today is to understand the 1990s and to understand how the 1990s fit into what preceded it. And as a way of giving some very gross schema, schemas, I try to direct the students' uh, attention to what I very typically say are four things that happened in architecture or four things that architecture assimilated and expressed in the 1990s, which have provided the foundations both, you know, contra and and pro and contra for where we exist, for where we are today, and they will illuminate all of the attitudes that are circulating today. And I name these things to the students, and I hope that they will do a little more research. Number one, of course, is the advent of neoliberalism in our global, and, and that includes globalization. It includes, you know, post-Fordism. Neoliberalism is, the, is this general idea that markets and free markets have an intelligence that will guide us to the destination in the most, uh, shall we say, beneficial and efficient way. Neoliberalism was a way of understanding that the spontaneous forces around us uh, were enough to produce justice. And this was a complete, it was an atrocious idea, but it was the most profound transformation 
of our experience and our culture that in fact anyone alive today can, uh, could ever point to. That was number one. But in architecture, we had a lot of very important developments. Number two was the advent of the computer and of digitization, which completely changed little by little, but in fact, in a very profound way, nobody didn't experience it as a change. We had the paperless studios, we had the incredible infatuations with the, with the, with the, the new generations of new software uh, that were coming out and so on and so forth. So the, the computer, com computation and digitization along with the neoliberalist, the, the neoliberal uh, transformations of uh, morals and government uh, and governmentality and everything else. The third is the rise of the sciences of complexity, of the nonlinear idea, the transformation that we found in, um, in our general approach to knowledge, which became increasingly oriented to the research and, 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 and grasp of what came to be known as qualities and the qualitative aspects of the of the of the physical world shall we say as, as opposed to the merely um, um, quantitative so this so-called switch from the quantitative from the great classical truisms of, of the modern era of rational procedure these began to shift with the rise of these new sciences toward the qualitative now i'm not saying well, let me say, you can see already some very fascinating paradoxes. Uh, these can be explained, but I'm not going to do it now. And the third, of course, and uh, the fourth was in architecture. In architecture in the 1990s was the hegemony of the Deleuzian um, philosophy of nature and all of the thinkers and the traditions that were activated thereby. That's to say there was, because in, especially in a thousand plateaus, there was a tacit, uh, there was an efficiency, there was a tacit feeling that some of those concepts could explain and like a universal acid that they could dissolve all of these other developments into a model of understanding. And that's to say it provided concepts that were of use on every level for understanding and for generation to degenerate ideas. So I try to let the students realize that these are four universes that came together in a certain kind of way, even if that era in a way largely necessarily became eclipsed. Let's just say this, it was very, very rich highly accelerative, to use the term that some people still like to use, highly disruptive. It was extraordinarily creative as well because it created a whole new synthesis. And it's that synthesis that is that was experienced so intensely, but which was not fully consciously imaged, shall we say, uh, or, or theorized, but nonetheless, it was there. We, we, it is the, it is the foundation from which I believe everything today can be explained in terms of one or another inheritance, rejection, or let's just say attitude vis-a-vis -vis that particular moment. Now, I would like to also say so that there's no, is that we are now in a transition and where a new moment is forming. It is not necessarily going to be quite as coherent and as powerful as that one, but there are new things in play today. And I do believe, unlike many, it's never too late to theorize one's moment in history. I know that I break with a lot of people who say, it's too early, it's too early. The image won't appear until much later, until after we're out of it. Um, this is a kind of hygiene that some historians and some theorists like to observe. I never understood it myself, but it's personal. But I would like to say is that it's important always, always to understand that when we begin to speak, that we are speaking inside of just such an ecology, if you like, just such an ecology of, 
of action, of mind, of ideas, of culture, uh, everything. I, so I always like, uh, I always feel that that's an important thing to do. Now, the other thing, of course, one has to understand, and I'm not going into this now, is that that particular 90s description or map, we'll call it a cartography, which I give, which I know is utterly schematic, um, its meaning, and I'm not going into this right now, but its meaning had to do in the ways in which it reconfigured the environment that preceded it. So uh, it, that's part of the DNA that I didn't just present, but that's part of a DNA that one should um, also factor in. But what that is meant to do is to also bring our attention and to activate the components of what, of what, in, what, of, of what lies immediately around us that we are now failing to see. And I would say that um, there have been a lot of opportunity. Okay, so the reason I even brought this up was to say that there was a generation ultimately who got shaped during this period of the, grand, of the great synthesis who found uh, there to be very little oxygen remaining for them. That's to say oxygen for producing their own ideas and their own concepts. And what happened ultimately was uh, the talent, the, the ratio of talent to ideas was massively, massively weighted against the ideas. There was so much more talent than there had ever been before. And I say that, I want to say that, that generation is talented beyond belief. But their capacity, as John Bolton would say, in a way to direct this talent with a philosophy, whoa, that fell very, very, uh, that fell very, very short. I feel for them. There was, I want to tell you all this, I'm going to say this right now in a public forum. And it was Jeff Kipnis who more or less helped me get to this point. I decided literally to shut up for six years, stop publishing and shut up and just let, because you know, I represented one of a bunch of people, I would say maybe who stole the oxygen, at least all of the most wonderful, talented people. I, I, said, I decided let's shut up and let them do their thing let them find their way. And I would have to say is this, is that, uh, you know, I did my own research during those years in other areas. And uh, after the six years was up, I have to say, I couldn't bear to be quiet anymore. Um, and that is because uh, what I saw was, was troubling. So that's, I just want to leave it there. And that is to say that I shall be quiet no longer. Uh, even if I'm like some kind of old fucking boomer on the horizon screaming like a, uh, like a, what do you call it? Like an, what do they call those guys who scream in the streets? Um, um, uh, the, what's that syndrome called? Um, <laughs> that syndrome where you, 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 you yell uh, obscenities. Tourette. Tourette's, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like a Tourette's, uh, an old critic, an old theorist from architecture with Tourette's syndrome. Um, but I have to say also is that the, in my opinion, my opinion, um, there have been extraordinary rich uh, veins that have emerged <laughs> after the 1990s that a lot of the architectural profession has for some reason missed. And that is uh, part of what needs to be uh, brought back. Now, Marika also knows that I am uh, very committed to at least, uh, you know, uh, and bringing theory back, uh, or at least making a great push to bring theory back uh, for a new generation. And, uh, it, you know, I don't think it's going to be successful, but I like the idea that it is going to be a very public failure. And Marika has very generously agreed to, in one way or another, uh, now or maybe soon, uh, be, be, be part of it. But I think that is one area that must be, um, that must be uh, activated, besides the one that I've been speaking about, the neurobiological uh, uh, arena, uh, the one that neither the experiential one, I do, you know, I could go on about where of what are what I believe architecture, the opportunities that architecture is missing. Um, 
so, uh, you know, let me just basically say that is that people hate it, especially people of more or less, I think, of, with the historical experience of so many of the people who are listening to us today. They don't like it when I draw or when I use generational um, uh, cliches to explain um, historical conditions. But the fact of the matter is, I'm very aware that there, I, I feel very certain whether I'm right or wrong. I feel certain, I feel very convinced that, um, um, that there is a difficulty, shall we say, there is a gap of, histor uh, of understanding and historic experience. It is difficult to pass um, ethical information from our generation to the, the ones who are emerging now because there has been, um, there has been uh, a, a break, if you like, of connection uh, to the historical experience. And I believe that today, how to restore the, 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 the sense that what one does in architecture um, needs to connect to the realities of the peer of the of the age in which you are operating, and to the environment, the 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 the, the, the very um, uh, what's the word the 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 obduracy and the urgency of our of the organizing structure of the world we are in. Um, that what we do in architecture uh, needs to be seen as connected to it and not just to social media feeds. Sava, can I, can I pick up on that? That was, that, was, uh, that was fantastic. One of the things I find interesting is with my students now, no one knows who Derrida was, no one knows what deconstruction was, and very few people know what Deleuze was. Now, that could in part be put down to a kind of cultural amnesia in the sense that I, you know, I do think that in some ways uh, one of the facets of contemporary culture. I think Andreas Hoysen, uh, he wrote this book, Twilight Memories, a kind of Baudrillardian take on, on history and memory. We, we, we've been saturated by all this information that kind of somehow to the point that we don't really remember anything at all. And it somehow, to my mind, is astonishing how, you know, you mentioned how you can't even remember what it was like before COVID, you know, we, the, the, the kind of world we had when we were flying and things, you know, I certainly can't, but, you know, I, 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 even, I, I before this, I was thinking, I, I can't even remember what, what, what life was like before before the internet, before it, before you know, uh, those kind of things, and it was a whole world that we, 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 we anyway. So something's happened, and I don't know. It's just, it, maybe it's amnesia that's part of that, and maybe the world has accelerated in a point we don't really have that sort of deep memory um, that was in the, part of the past. But I want to just kind of throw out two because I think Deleuze was very, very interesting for a lot of sort of reasons within architectural culture. Of course, he was completely misunderstood, as I would say the whole time. I mean, as was Derrida, which is unfortunate, but anyway, never mind. A kind of creative misunderstanding was maybe okay. But there were two things I, I think is kind of interesting. I just want to, I want to drop just to register my, my, my agreement, uh, yeah. if I may. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so Deleuze, okay. On the one hand, I mean, I, I, I was really transfixed by, by Delanda's message. Um, uh, this was in 99 when I was teaching in Columbia and I was just sitting in on his seminars and in a way, you could criticize what he was saying because in a sense it wasn't Dela it wasn't Deleuze so much as Delanda's Deleuze, right? I mean, he kind of ended it out Qatari and he just had Deleuze and it was a very kind of new, new materialist um, take on things, but at the same time, uh, it was kind of interesting. And the way that Manuel described to me what he was doing, because in a way, if you're truly Deleuze, they're kind of, it's not a binary opposition, but there's kind of these, uh, uh, what the, what's the word he used? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> um, reciprocal presupposition, that these two different worlds. And in some ways, what I think that, uh, that Delanda was doing was seeing that after postmodernism, after this kind of obsession with the representational, um, we, we needed to have some, a kind of corrective to kind of counterbalance that. And hence this, uh, this kind of emphasis on, on process, on, on a kind of a much more kind of, well, anyway, a kind of the, the view we all know so well with kind of new materialism. That's one thing. And, and But then what happened, I think, now after that was it kind of, Everyone describes to me American politics as being like a pendulum. It almost the pendulum swung back after that, you know, very uh, important corrective. We go back to a kind of representational discourse of triple O and, and I don't know what else. Um, that's one thing. So there was that happened to Deleuze in some way. But then there was something else even more weird. And I just want to get your take on this one uh, is that is to say Deleuze somehow disappeared into the rabbit hole of accelerationism. And I don't understand that at all. You know, 
Um, I, I, I recall the days when, when you know, the AA was so progressive and everyone was talking in this kind of way and somehow there's a kind of a, a right-wing turn that's happened within theoretical circles where people are talking very dogmatically in a way that was never there in the, in the past. But there's also been a kind of particular individuals um, have switched allegiance in a way that I find absolutely astonishing. Now, as much as I like Patrick Schumach, I mean, I, I, he's an amazing guy. He's very generous with his time. And uh, I don't, he just does so much, you know, it's incredible how much he gets through. I, you know, I, I admire, but I completely disagree in the kind of the way that he's swung way to the right from, I mean, he was a kind of almost Trotskyist at some point. Now he's a kind of, you know, neo-libertarian something. You know, I've been invited to this conference to, about li 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 neoliberalism. I, I, I despise that intensely. The only reason why I agreed to go to the conference to go, was to criticize it, but that's happened. Then there's another character, when I was back in the UK, um, the University of Nottingham in uh, it, uh, um, Warwick, there were a bunch of really smart individuals, Sadie Plant and the guy called Nick Land. Now, what the hell's happened to Nick Land? I mean, he's now in Shanghai and there is this kind of weird accelerationism going on. And I don't know what that is, um, and I just, I wanted to get your take on that because you mentioned uh, uh, kind of libertarianism and I, I find it as disturbing as you do, but how the hell did that happen? That we it's not just a, it's not an amnesia, it's a kind of collective kind of like swing to the right. Um, what do you well, think? Well, uh, you know, let me ask you, I, I'd, rather answer, I'd rather respond to what you just said, not to you personally, but to our audience. Meaning I'd like to respond in a way that would make sense to our audience because, you know, the hairs are standing up on the back of my neck, too, when you remind me of these things that are taking place. So I would like to say, well, in terms of Schumacher, it's a very personal thing how he and I, by the way, he's gone. Be, he's got he's well beyond neo-libertarianism. He uh, really feels very free. To plunge. Into into fascist discourse um, and into crypto and even neo-fascist uh, economics and other things. He just, uh, he just went that way. Now I will say something in a second, more, a little bit about that. So in terms of accelerationism, um, yeah, I find that, I find it, uh, it's just part of this, opportunistic, uh, you know, okay, so let me say this, there are life, as a general rule, all life forms must take their, they must discover niches in the environment. And every niche is impacted and limited, if you like, by the, uh, by the distribution of finite resources upon which there are a number of claims being made. And what happens is, is the interaction of species and environment come to a kind of accommodation, which is basically a kind of equilibrium. In today's intellectual environment, um, because of all of these artificial uh, contexts, shall we say, that is no longer happening. And yes, you get these runaway, you get these runaway things happening like the accelerationists. Everybody's looking for a, but I would just, let's say this, is the amount of encouragement, shall we say, that is provided by online culture that can seemingly almost as if it as if it was a resource, uh, a reservoir of resources uh, that was infinite, such that any idea that can catch fire will. And then the feedback comes, it's a kind of encouragement and then so on and so forth. I find accelerationism, I find a lot of these ideas that came out of speculative realism to be, I have to say, because speculative realism, in my opinion, was already based on a profoundly naive denial of the historical and the historical development of thought and became and was so fraught with a number of shall we say serendipitous revivals of uh, conservative uh, concepts without having to test or measure itself against if you like 
um, the the more the, the more you know, the, the the developments of modern thought gave place and free permission, if you like, to uh, these things. But I want to say one more thing that's important here is the 1990s, as I described it, and Deleuze specifically. There was a component here which was troubling, uh, especially with the, and I find this also in Foucault. They were, uh, they were creating a system, shall we say, of emancipatory ethics and thought in relation to uh, uh, an understanding of the structure of power that had been inherited, if you like, that still had its roots in the dominant uh, forms of top-down power uh, that still were rooted in the organization of, you know, uh, of knowledge uh, and superstition that belonged, if you like, to a pre-modern world. In other words, the rational organization, uh, the rational structures were seen to be ultimately oppressive to the degree that they suppressed, if you like, more, uh, uh, more imminent, shall we say, and more, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm going to use this word, but I don't want to be using it in this particular context, but you say the more spontaneous uh, 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 aspects, life, shall we say, of, uh, of the body, of matter, and so on and so forth. Now, what happened was the flow idea, or shall we say the smoothness and this, this uh, type of this self-organization idea got, became the dominant mode of oppression, ultimately, meaning it became it became the way in which society organized itself. You know, neoliberalism, is, once it discovered the, the smooth paradigm, it occupied it just like a virus is opportunistic in its ability to select those portions of a population which are most congenial to it. What we believe, what we did, and, and everybody went straight off and continued theorizing the, the, the rig, retrograde and oppressive reorganization of our social, cultural, political, and economic universes. And they failed because, like you pointed out, when you say this about Derrida, it's even true. I hate Derrida, I want you to know. But I also 100% agree with you is that the deeper aspects of his thought and what it was meant to attack were largely lost by architects because it was so useful for the production of form. And that's all that was really grasped for it. It was, it failed to be a radical, um, it failed to be a radical philosophy in the sense in which it tried to understand how knowledge, the pre uh, how knowledge underlay form. Now, that connection is one, uh, you and I can do this in our teaching until we're blue in the face, and it will be continually forgotten by each subsequent generation. And I'm sure you find that it's even very difficult to communicate this in the classroom today, because we're no longer aided and abetted by the culture and the reading culture around us, which we used to be able to rely on for its resonance. Another kind of a problem, which is why we have to continually in any topic that we study, such as you're doing now with AI, and I want to say it's a wonderful thing that you dedicated an entire book and, no, and not just, you know, a creepy little, you know, post face <laughs> or epilogue uh, as a kind of a warning on the AI thing. No, really, it's an important thing to monumentalize the, the concern, shall we say, with uh, an uncritical approach. So, but the point is, is the connection of knowledge, and this is something obviously that, you know, I picked up in my education, particularly with Foucault and, and, and others, but it is, and I always see this, is always going to be the case, is the underlying foundations of knowledge. Now, I'm not a cultural constructionist, as so many in the Anglo-Saxon world uh, believed that that was the lesson of Foucault. Um, no, 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 it simply isn't. And that's also because 
they did not see the way in which Foucault came out of a, uh, out of a philosophical tradition. Um, but that's a whole other thing. So when I say all of this, um, I would say that how did it happen? I don't think you should, and I don't think our audience should think that it is a trend. It is simply part of this landscape of everybody just gets to say whatever they bloody like and create their own pseudo history or pseudo precursors uh, for it. Accelerationism, it's good that you, def you basically said it is actually a form of libertarianism. It is a form of extreme uh, neoliberalism. Um, and frankly, it's stupid. I, I'm shocked that anybody could think it's interesting after 20 painful years of neoliberalism. But it's also true that nobody is, uh, nobody any longer really reads or understands exactly what was of concern about the rise of post Fordism or neoliberalism anymore. It's just considered a party right now. Uh, and accelerationism, a lot of people think, well, you know, more AI, all the better is what an architect often thinks. I mean, it's fascinating. It's engaging. It's urgent. Uh, it's sexy in a weird way, or at least one imagines it might be. But accelerationism is the same kind of thing. People like to have something to say when they get up. Schumacher, man, he just went off. He just went off. He just went off. Uh, I love the guy too. I want to say I love the guy too. And I have to say one thing is you can slam him, you can beat him, you can bruise him in public. And it's cool. He's fine. He's cool. He can take it, as I'm sure you know. Um, and I also have to say his lectures are almost universally seen as, um, as, uh, as comedy. Uh, I don't know who really takes them uh, very seriously. So I would like to say, I don't consider Schumacher dangerous, although uh, I now realize, even as you point out, some of your best people work for him. And there's no way I think you can work for him without, frankly, feeling that some of the stuff that he studies is okay. Because um, some of the stuff that he studies is not okay. Dr. Sanford, I just want to pick up on one thing. There's this question from Victoria here, and I want to say, uh, invite others to, to launch in, because really, I mean, we have some great people in the audience, and I, I don't know if it's possible to get the auditing people to make ask questions too, but just to say one thing, I think one of the important things, I know that you're, you're not so fond of Derrida. I mean, I personally think I, I found him really, I mean, he was misunderstood, and, and, and it didn't help that he had this kind of obscurantist way of using language and du Breton and whatever and so on. But I do think one of the things he, in his essay that I, I reprinted in Rethinking Architecture on uh, Plan de Folie, Maintenant de l'Architecture, uh, he, he's basically, what he's saying is Billy, theory is about, if you want to use this kind of these philosophical concepts and things, you've got to uh, use them to attack the theory behind the form making and not the form making itself. Now, that seems to be the, the, the kind of elision of that. So we're now getting in the kind of Bartlett sort of way of thinking that uh, increasingly you use theory to justify form. It's not about that. It's about questioning the thinking behind the architectural form making itself. Or at least it seems to me that's where it has its, its real potential. Um, it, it, we have, a, we have um, I want to uh, unmute Victoria Uzui Babo. Um, uh, I don't know how you do that. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so yeah, I, I I think it's really really important that we talk about um, these things, and um, I want to speak, you know, um, for I think myself and uh, a few friends of mine, and I know also, especially from this uh, group of people that is um, attending the seminar, um, that I'm not alone. Um, I think many of us have fallen victim to neoliberal mechanisms um, of the architecture economy. And um, through that also, you know, it's a, it's a matter of time, actually having the time to read. And I myself have to get up at, um, you know, five or six in the morning sometimes to even like find the time before or after my job to read. And I do it because I find it very important. And I see it, um, you know, I think we also have to find some kind of um, new trajectory for ourselves, for our generation. And um, I just, you know, this is an image that um, resonated very much with, uh, you know, with me when I, when I was um, introduced to it. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, the idea of uh, what I talked about yesterday, the uh, margins and the glitches in the system um, that enable us to think about, you know, the, the things that we've not paid attention to um, 
maybe again. And um, the image that I want to invoke is, first of all, um, the idea of a crystal um, that is growing and that often needs a very small seat or a pattern as a precursor to actually grow into something very large. And then the other thing is uh, where these seeds can be found sometimes is actually when a system is stretched and it starts opening cracks. Um, Darwin has this uh, interesting idea about the ecosystem or a system um, as a floor slab that is made out of planks. And when it's stretching and it's growing, it actually creates new um, niches of affordance for new life and new thought. And I want to encourage um, you know, myself and our generation to see possibility and enter the discussions from there. Because I think to actually re replicate the slabs in their full you know, intensity takes a lot of effort and time that we might not even have because we are in a system that is very different. So um, what I want to say is basically that this coronavirus crisis that we're in right now has actually um, pulled back the veil of many of uh, the guises that um, this, this, these mechanisms have been hidden behind. And I think we should see it as an opportunity for our generation to enter into discussions as we do right now and not be afraid to enter into these discussions because I think what has shown this, this crisis has shown every single one of us that the data that is collected about every individual and that we hear about in the news is very different than the individual qualitative experience that we have during this crisis. Everyone has a very different experience. And I think what I want to make, uh, the point that I want to make with that is that we are embedded in a context. And I think we see how important it is because the experience that we have during this crisis is a physical one, a mental one, and a social one. And I think it is very important to pay attention to that. And so I think I'm just calling for more attention um, to what is around us. And um, I mean, there's a whole, you know, another point that I, I want to get into, but I think I'll leave it at that. Um, so kind of an encouragement to everyone. Sanford, you're muted. Sanford, you're muted. Trying to talk. How do you know I'm trying to talk? Like, how do you notice that? Well, you're muted now, my friend. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're oh, like, really, but I, but do I, I, whatever, guys. First of all, let me say that I very, very uh, greatly appreciate uh, what uh, that, that comment uh, that we just heard, uh, but for very, very selfish reasons. And that is because I keep forgetting to say I agree with it 100%. There is something utterly magical about what has taken place in the last three or four months. Now, I have to tell you, from the middle of New York City, there were some dark, 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 dark moments. And I have to also say, if anyone who's in the United States, thankfully most of you are not, what is coming is even darker still. But um, in New York City, it was palpable. The death was everywhere. You could almost smell it when you went outside, when I had to go outside and walk my dog. Um, many of the people I used to run into as I walked my dog died. And uh, it's just unbelievable, the, 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 the darkness that we had. But at the same time, what a gift. What a gift it has been. In fact, I will be sad when it's over uh, in many ways. It was like a Sabbath for the mind in a way. And even though the mind was, 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 was prevailed upon, the, the mind was occupied, the mind was made to suffer, there was still an opening. There was an opening, there was free time, and there was a chance to look back and to look around. There was a chance to assess and reassess. Now, I have to say, strictly from the point of view of, and to invoke the title of a book that many people find, you know, what should we do with our brains? It reminds us that we can do what we like with them, but we need to, we need to alter, if we like, we need to alter our spatial temporal environment in order to be able to make different uses of the brain possible. But yes, what an opportunity to begin to think, to feel, to ruminate to read, et cetera, et cetera. I think that it's also true that since we are being forced to experience this, we may demand it in the future. We may demand, uh, 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 what is the word, relief from the, the neoliberal onslaught, which grabs every single moment of our attention in a kind of a, a frenzy of productive demand. 
Um, so I would say that, yes, um, our intellectual culture, our ethical culture may very well find in this crisis uh, the seeds of a very, very, uh, a very interesting and beautiful uh, uh, new way of living and what we consider to be an absolute minimum requirement um, uh, for a, a good life, if you like. So, so Sam, forgot, I, this is, uh, thank you, Victoria. And I mean, it's great to, uh, to see people like you emerging and also Marika as a kind of like a, the next generation that's kind of taking up the baton and, and uh, uh, evoking this, the need to kind of debate these things. And, and I, I completely agree as Sam does with, with what you have to say. <clears throat> but I just wanted to, uh, first of all, two things. Well, one thing, can, can, if anybody else has some questions, please uh, raise your hand as it were. Um, but secondly, I want to go back to you, Safran. What was it? You made this reference. It's kind of, it's, we've got darker times ahead. What are you referring oh, to? Precisely? Oh, I'm talking, of, well, you're in, yeah, you're in LA, man. You know very well. Um, it's very, very simple. There's nothing cryptic about it. Uh, the rate of infection in the United States now is uh, higher than it ever was, even in the darkest uh, uh, days of, um, of early April. Um, the 48,000 or more, 50,000 new cases per day um, is almost twice what it was at its worst earlier moment, but it is uh, expected it will go to 100,000. Now, uh, it... We, the context is very different uh, now. That's to say, Americans have elaborated this grotesque discourse of resistance, if you like, to acknowledging uh, what's happening. Uh, they now they no longer see it as a biological process, but actually only as a uh, a political and ethical one which basically means, you know, the hospitals, look, I, I, I spent years in, in Houston. Houston is, has the greatest concentration, I believe in the world, of hospitals, of hospital, of medical technology, and of uh, medical personnel. The hospitals in Houston uh, reached 102% capacity in their intensive care units uh, yesterday, and it's about to go. It's about to. It's about to go quickly toward uh, being completely in an unmanageable crisis on the order of what Italy experienced and of what Wuhan, in its darkest moments, experienced. Now it's fascinating because that is the that is the center of the medical universe. In fact, there. I remember I was teaching at Rice University there were probably five massive research hospitals uh, the size of Rice University, uh, just you know, within, uh, uh, within a mile of the, uh, of the campus. Now, um, the fact of the matter is, is that, oh, well, by the way, I didn't see Trump's speech today at 9.30, but when I say the darkest moments is uh, of what's coming, not only death, but the fact of the matter is, is to have allowed it to go to a second phase and given what types of mentalities and attitudes have been allowed to be cultivated and to arise to create a form of, shall we say, political resistance um, to doing what needs to be done is, 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 the, is, is, start, is putting in the seeds of a catastrophe beyond what was you know, darkly uh, uh, imagined or, or, or speculated upon three and a half months ago. So, you know, L.A., I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see it even in L.A. So I'm going to say that, you know, uh, you know that is, 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 is New York going to be able to, you know, in Canada, for I'm Canadian, I can't go to Canada. Uh, and if I were to go to Canada, if I were to do all of the documentation, if I were to try to get into the country, if I were to do on and, 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 and jump through all the hoops that they are uh, imposing in order to protect uh, their population. And by the way, it's they're, they're nothing. Uh, they have nothing like the kind of psychic culture that the uh, that the Americans have. They really want to beat this thing. The uh, penalty, I would have to go into a 14 day um, quarantine. Uh, and I would be checked on. And if I was found to violate the quarantine, if, if, if a cop found me in the street 
walking outside um, the street, the fines they're imposing are a quarter of a million dollars. I just letting you guys know is like there are some countries that take it seriously and believe that that uh, that they can justify uh, presenting these types of uh, conditions uh, to their population because they can they can think the problem they can they can they can without having to deny if you like the reality but that is not going to happen in the united states in the united states we you know we have this idea that you can say science is just one narrative so santa let me just pick up on that i mean i i i kind of predicted this i mean i don't know it's easy to say that but anyone you know, who paid attention predicted it you're right <laughs> yeah i mean the thing is it was you know and i think that well there is a virtue in now discovering, and Zizek as well, and others have been talking about this, about kind of a certain discipline and even the use of surveillance to make sure for the for the greater good. Um, I mean, I've never had quite that problem with surveillance issues anyway in the first place, but I, now we're now reconfiguring that. But um, the thing that I want to go back and, and get your, your take on this is, is, you know, what I see happening is people, you know, uh, you get these guys with guns, you know, going into... Uh, um, uh, public assembly buildings and things, and, and you get them basically saying, "I'm not going to compromise my freedom by wearing a mask." You know, and I, you know, to my mind, this is something really astonishing. What happened? It's in a way uh, the word freedom, which I associate with kind of the French Revolution, which is actually a freedom for the sake of society as a whole, somehow got mutated and translated into neo-libertarianism, which is something of freedom where forget society, it's about me personally. And I don't know what happened, how that happened, but I mean, it, that is the nature of translation itself, right? You lose the, the background meaning, but I just wanted to whether, whether you see that connection as, as the problem being to do with that kind of, and of course, as I was saying the other day, uh, to here on another forum, Americans like to think they're free, but I don't think they're free at all. They're completely governed by a kind of neo-libertarian outlook, which which leads to this kind of uh, situation. I have nothing to add. Uh, America is a it's an atrocity. Uh, you add de Tocqueville, or you add Trump to de Tocqueville, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of our audience doesn't know who de Tocqueville is, but he was a brilliant French. You could almost say ethnographer. Uh, he came to the United States. He wrote a book called Democracy in America, probably 200 years ago. It still remains a book that you, when you read it, you will say it feels like it was written yesterday. It was such a brilliant um, description of these philosophical underpinnings of the American psyche. And, you know, if you allow those attitudes, if you like, avenues of development, as in Trump has created, he has opened them up, if you like. If you do not rein in, you know, thought, if you do not, anyway, the point is, is yes, this is what's happened. This is what has happened. Uh, the biggest question is not the question that you ask, because there's nothing we can do to explain this. This is America. It's shocking. And it has been allowed to get out of control. The question is, can you put the genie back into the bottle ever? And if you can't, that is a serious situation that we're looking at now. Um, if that can't be put back, if those, you know, even a switch in government, if you, I mean, can you reverse that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, we've got 20 minutes left. Um, uh, Victoria, you, I know you've got a second question, Victoria. I'd like to see uh, anyone else who's got a, got a question. Maybe, Victoria, while we're, while we're waiting for another question, you can say, say yours, um, your second one. Do you, do you want to do that? Uh, sure. Sorry. Um, I just, you know, I, I have a lot like that I've been thinking about. Um, and I think, you know, maybe it's, um, it has to do with um, a lack of being able to trust. Um, in systems, I mean, the United States is a very extreme example, but maybe it even has to do and that, you know, I know it's a, it's a pretty, you know, I'm, I'm putting myself out there with saying that, but maybe we even um, have an inability to trust ourselves because we have externalized trust um, 
very often and have put trust in uh, external mechanisms um, that can solve problems for us. And I mean, AI is probably even, you know, could be counted among those. And I think it is maybe time to kind of, you know, go back and listen to oneself and maybe establish a certain trust in the capacity of the human, um, which includes oneself and the body. And um, I, I mean, for me, it was really interesting. I've um, been uh, reading and, and looking into Whitehead and um, Masumi, Brian Masumi, who talks about Whitehead and you know perception. And he brings up the term of prehension um, where everything is uh, basically in motion and a world is forming around us. And um, human beings are always embedded in context. And so it's in motion. So basically um, we are, as, a, as, as we are in motion, the world around us is in motion and it's these two systems meeting. And um, we've always tried to kind of abstract that and might maybe find an external way to explain it, but we don't really pay complete attention to what is happening inside of us. And um, so Brian Masumi has this interesting um, comparison where he uh, compares the typical brain. And I think I talked about this yesterday briefly where the typical brain jumps quickly to definitions of elements in the environment, which is also called neural entrainment. And we kind of tend to forget about all the margins and um, the atypical brains that go through these decision process in a very different um, speed. And so I think it is maybe a way to kind of, you know, go very far back and look at the individual um, in this time right now and see that there's very different ways of perceiving and very different ways of uh, apprehending and um, that we can actually, you know, instill trust in these mechanisms and maybe even like pay more attention to them and see the different times that we, you know, live in. So um, I think that is, that is for me kind of the way forward. And um, that is kind of opening a new door for me personally um, to kind of start, you know, engaging in that neuroplasticity and um, also start learning and unlearning um, in a world of constant flow. Victoria, wow. do, 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 you, do you, are you teaching? <laughs> you no. should be. I think it's really important to have voices like yours um, carrying on the baton in some way. I mean, also Marika, you know, it, uh, I, I guess Marika's a little slightly different generation, but, but, you know, I think this is so important to kind of keep this critical, critical discourse alive, especially in, in architectural environments. Um, Neil, you need to hire Victoria. Uh, we tried, we tried, and uh, we will try again. But uh, yeah, you ought to do that. Since everything's online now, it, you know, you don't have to fly people around. Um, uh, she's extraordinarily, uh, I mean, you know, committed actually uh, to ideas and, uh, you know, her presence in any classroom I know would be inspiring. Um, I would like to respond to a couple of things there simply because uh, I think we have to uh, anger or not anger, I mean, excite uh, Marika a little bit to respond here because she's a, she's a link uh, for us uh, to um, you know, to, uh, to where the energy is today. Um, you know, 20, whatever, I don't know how long ago, I wrote a book uh, called uh, Far From Equilibrium, uh, whose, um, whose core or uh, keystone concept was, uh, was absolutely missed by every reader, except for one, uh, that happened to be Harry Cobb who I'm very sad to say uh, died a few months ago, just before the COVID crisis um, at the age of, I'm not sure what, maybe 94. He was a good pal of mine, but he, uh, that's no reason why. He, the concept was called radical anamnesis. And um, that was uh, the concept that underlay all of the essays in that book. Um, and the fundamental idea, anamnesis is a kind of, um, is a kind of uh, uh, deliberate and energetic, uh, meaning a, a, uh, remembering, to remember what has, uh, 
you know, what has fallen uh, out, you know, what has, what has fallen, let's just say, out of our domain of concern. And remember it because it is also us to remember, to, let's say, ourselves. And radical anamnesis, basically, the way I described it there was uh, just to say that the past, in the past, it doesn't contain everything that is exists inside of us in terms of our potential, but it reminds us or it will redirect us to note that this stuff exists inside of us. And it's to say to look at the past at all of the paths that were opened but not followed or not taken by history. Um, and the bottom I, the last idea here is, is that instead of us all the tendency now is to see what arises and to immediately try to integrate it into our, the word we, I like to use is the, um, uh, what do you call that thing you put on your back where you put your tools, uh, if you're a hunter gatherer, into your, um, oh, I just forgot the word, into your quiver, into your quiver. Uh, that is not the task we need to do. In fact, it is really to impose some of our own uh, In some of our own, shall we say, constructions and values uh, in order to counter or even in order to create the cultural context that we want uh, for ourselves. So I have to say that uh, the, the neuroatypicality that is uh, that was invoked by Victoria is one way that uh, critics and theorists today are expressing or at least imaging to themselves the unbelievable richness of possibility that exists as a reservoir that we just have not understood that that is what it is. The neuroatypicality, you're more likely to hear the term neural diversity uh, than a neuroatypicality, so you'll recognize it, but it basically tells us that in this world in which every human being is a uh, is an entirely unique organism on a certain level and to every organism there is an absolutely specific world that idea of course should be in my opinion the guiding political mantra uh, that an architect would follow today uh, we have a, a question coming up from Antonio Banacci did, you, did Marika did you want to say something well, I just wanted to—I just wanted to say so. So Neil, to your so, so Neil and I share um, um, an appreciation of Derrida that Stanford does not does not. Um, and I wanted to talk for a minute about that the the extraordinary act of radical amnesis um, that Derrida performed um, toward the end of his life when he wrote a collection. I I lent it to Stanford. Um, it's called the Work of Mourning. Um, and I couldn't, he, he couldn't, it was too kind of, uh, uh, um, I think, um, claustrophobic for him. Um, but um, that kind of work is what I think contributes in an active and informed and real way to our ability to construct our own view of things. And that is not the same as um, the right saying, you know, we create, uh, you know, kind of a kind of magical, uh, magical thinking, or we create our own reality, but it's about constructing structures and the ones that are thrown at us by false theories of accelerationism. So I actually don't think that we're necessarily on, in different camps on this, um, and I maybe would would suggest that you. <laughs> try to find the, the, the tolerance for the closed spaces of the work of mourning because it is um, a truly exactly the kind of thinking that you're advocating that we participate in. Okay, uh, let's, Antonio, um, <coughs> trying to unmute the audio. Oh, oh, sorry, I think someone else do it at the same time. Let me try one more time. Yeah, Antonio, go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, well, I. Thanks where are you, Antonio? Answer. Can you hear me? Yes. But where are you, by the way? I'm in Bangkok, in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, um, well, I would like to attempt to quickly reconnect 
with the discourse that was the original focus on artificial intelligence. Um, and that ultimately is what brought this uh, multi-generational group here, whether we uh, refer to uh, generational cliches or not. Um, and Professor Quinter earlier uh, mentioned as the third uh, crucial turn uh, that happened in the 90s and affected architecture very profoundly, um, he, he referred to no, the, the issue of non-linearity and ultimately to the idea that dealing with uh, dealing in a complex way with qualitative aspects. And uh, nonetheless, in the following decades, actually, uh, the quantification and if you want the parameterization of any aspect of life uh, has just increased and extremely. And so I would like to, uh, to pose a question to, to all of you, uh, whether do you, you think that um, if a AI is actually acquiring the ability to deal with qualitative aspects faster and faster, you know, through uh, generative adversarial networks and so on, that was mentioned many times, um, actually, will it do it or not? Or, or would it rather just, uh, you know, extremize the logics of uh, quantitative optimization and so uh, ultimately the logics of exploitation and uh, neoliberalism? Well, thanks, Antonio. Uh, I hope that you're teaching too. Um, just to say, I think, you know, that uh, the, uh, you know, the two sides of the coin, but one thing I, I came across, which was, um, some research in MIT Media Lab, of course, has a cloud running over it right now for other reasons. But the research was quite interesting because it was able to use, harness the possibility of GANs to judge the safety of a neighborhood. And I, I, you know, I think I, all I would say is I wouldn't preclude that possibility. You know, I think that um, and in a way, almost that's what we need to be pushing for um, rather than this kind of blind adherence to uh, celebrating what can come out of the technology to really see how it could be used in a kind of critical uh, way to, to address qualities. Um, maybe Sanford like to want to say something? Or Marika? Uh, you, unmute yourself, Sanford. This. How are you? Wonderful that you actually see me uh, screaming at my screen. <laughs> uh, I just like to say, first of all, I agree with, I want, I want to just second it. Uh, I hope Antonio, I hope you, I hope you teach. Yeah, I, I just it. hope you guys have a classroom because a classroom is the beginning. It is maybe a connection to the forum. And I have to say Zoom, as much as I hate it, is a remarkable thing because it weakened the walls of the classroom in a, in, in a productive as well as an unproductive way. But also it's, there's some importance in this idea. I hope you're in the classroom. Second thing I'd like to say is I know that AI could save us with respects to the pandemic. Uh, if everybody had, and they do, they have a device, they have a cell phone. If everybody's, if everybody had an app, if you like, and that there could be a real time um, integration of the information information about the pathology circulating through the population, the capacity to generate very clear pictures and models and the capacity to act almost instantaneously would, uh, there is no doubt, and the CDC knows it very well, would shut it down immediately. Now, there are a lot of, that this is not going to happen for a whole variety of reasons, but it's also true, even if we got to that point, and who wouldn't want it? The system, you can't go back. And suddenly, and suddenly you realize you've also paid for that triumph. You've paid for it by, in a very, very dear way with what, with, shall we say, the abdication of one's claim on political rights. Um, uh, and the right to be invisible or et cetera, and so on and so forth. Even when, you know, this whole, con this whole thing began with the, uh, with the description that Neil gave of turning up at the airport and discovering that the system already had his information 
in the system and it recognized him without him having to input any other detail about who he was. Um, it's ugly. For sure, it's ugly. Uh, for sure, we yeah. don't know.